Kalama Sutta, but I think uh, since it is just the three of us, I'll invite you on screen now, and that way if you have any questions, you can um, you can ask them as I go along. So, Lynn, I'll invite you on first, and I hope you can join us, and Kevin too. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, there. How are you, Lynn? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. So nice to see you. Ah, and there's Kevin. Hi, John. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Ah. I have two computers. Good to have you. Have you both here. My dog wants to get into my lap when he hears me talking. He wants to. He wants oh. to sit on me, but he can't right now, Bo. It's, Pick him up and uh, let's... Pardon me. Pick him up and let's see him. Let's meet yeah. your dog. Oh, come here. Come here, Boats. Come here. Come up here. Come here. Come here. Hey, I'll move the camera. Come here. Say hello. Oh, he's not hey. a lot. Uh, <laughs> That's Bodie. He's not quite Bodie. awakened yet, but he's he's uh, working on it. Okay. He keeps listening to these there. Dama stream talks. He's going to awaken soon, right? He's close. <laughs> he had just a little bit of clinging left, like right now. <laughs> Oh, okay. dog, dogs get a lot of the eightfold path already because they got integrity and, uh, you know, right effort. And they, they got a lot of it already. Right yeah. here, right? <laughs> he does. He, he does yeah. have a lot of it. So, okay, go lay down. Nope. <laughs> um, so today's talk is on the Kalama Sutta. And this is one of the suttas that um, people pick and choose. Uh, they do this a lot with the Buddhist teaching. And they use it to... to um, claim that the Buddha said that we should we should let our experience guide our Dhamma study, and through our experience, we should kind of pick and choose what we like and what we don't like. And of course, the Buddha never said that. In this sutta, the Buddha speaks um, directly to how important it is to maintain the authenticity of the Dhamma and develop that experience so that you can know what is effective and what is not effective. Uh, and I, I come up as a teacher, I come across this often that that notion that um, Buddhism should be basically whatever makes us feel good, whatever I want it to be, rather than a direct teaching to end all of those types of conditioned views. Um, and the Buddha taught this to a town uh, called the the, 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 uh, the the town folk were called the Kalamas. Um, and it was right near Kapilavastu where the Buddha first started teaching. But it was also on a trade route. So a lot of the uh, teachers at that time came through there and gave their teaching. And every one of them, of course, claimed that it was the, uh, the most advanced and most uh, effective Dhamma that there is out there. Uh, and it left the town very confused. And so I'm going to read from the article uh, that's on, on, the, on the site. The Buddha consistently presented the Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path as unique and distinct, not as a common teaching that could be integrated into other teachings according to the hardened beliefs of individuals. It is the insistence that the, Bo that the Buddhist teaching can and should be accommodated to individual and cultural beliefs that has resulted in a confusing and ineffective dharma. And certainly if you look at um, all the different presentations and applications of Buddhism today, it can be nothing but confusing. Different, uh, different goals, different types of uh, worship or no worship, different types of meditation, uh, different um, engagement with the Four Noble Truths, and many uh, modern Buddhist teachings uh, dismiss or at least diminish the Four Noble Truths in importance, and it's often presented as uh, kind of a preliminary or introductory teaching, when the truth of it is that that's all the Buddha ever taught. So the Buddha instructed the Kalamas uh, to not go, go by others' accounts or by legends or traditions, uh, meaning something that simply because it's well-established gives it some validity. He said, do not follow scriptures. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of later developed texts that people take as teachings of the Buddha when there's simply something that was put in place to, to prove a point. Uh, do not form conclusions through inference, analogies, or common agreement. Again, he's saying that just because a lot of, uh, a lot of people believe something or a lot of your friends believe something that you should just follow that blindly. He did say just simply investigate it and he teaches here how to investigate it. Uh, the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha was walking with a large group from the Sangha. They arrived at Kesapatu, I'm sorry, Kesaputta, 
uh, the town of the Kalamas. The Kalamas have heard that the Buddha was an awakened human being who teaches a complete path that is admirable in the beginning, in the middle, and in its conclusion, meaning the entire path is useful. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing distracting or ineffective in it. The Kalamas went to the Buddha and told him of the many teachers that come through their town, all claiming to have taught the one true Dhamma, while ridiculing other teachers and their teachings. They asked the Buddha, how are we to know which is useful and effective and which, what is not? The Buddha replies, of course you are uncertain and filled with doubt. When there are reasons for doubt, uncertainty will follow. Do not go by reports or legends or traditions or scripture or conjecture or inference or analogies or common agreement or even unexamined loyalty. When you know from your own experience that the qualities taught are unskillful, shameful, confusing, and distracting, these teachings should be abandoned. When these teachings are criticized by the wise, they should be abandoned. When these teachings lead to harm and suffering, they should be abandoned. So what do you think, Kalamas? When the three defilements of greed, aversion, and deluded thinking arise in a person, do they arise for benefit or for harm? And someone there in the, in the group said that defilements always bring harm. So he, immediately he's pointing out, how do you discern what is a useful Dhamma and what is not? If it leads to the development of the cessation of the three defilements, then it's a useful Dhamma. And if even in subtle ways it increases that, or at least doesn't even really address it, it's to be abandoned. And when a, the Buddha continues, and when a person is driven by the, by the defilements, their mind possessed, they kill other beings. They take what is not given. They take another spouse. They lie and induce others to lie, all of which create long-term harm and suffering for themselves and others. So what do you think, Kalamas? Are these defilements skillful or unskillful, shameful or shameless, criticized or praised by the wise? The defilements are unskillful, shameful, and always criticized by the wise. So when the defilements are acted upon, do they lead to long-term suffering for oneself and others or not? They always lead to long-term suffering for oneself and others. So as I said, do not go by reports or legends or traditions or scripture. Do not follow conjecture or inference or analogies or common agreement or unexamined loyalty. When you know from your own experience that the qualities taught are unskillful, shameful, confusing, and distracting, these teachings should be abandoned. And that goes back to that line that that everybody, uh, not everybody, uh, many modern Buddhists claim that the Buddha says that we should just go by our own experience. It's our own experience within the framework of the Eightfold Path that will show us whether something is increasing the defilements or not. So when these teachings are criticized by the wise, they should be abandoned. When these teachings lead to harm and suffering, they should also be abandoned. Now, don't go by reports or legends or traditions or scriptures or conjecture or inference or analogies or common agreement or unexamined loyalty. The Buddha is really covering everything there, isn't he? Uh, when you know from your own experience that the qualities taught are skillful, shameful, shameless, unambiguous, and direct. That's an important line there, or important word, direct. They get right to the heart of the matter. Then these teachings should be developed. There's no ambiguity, ambiguity, ambiguity into the Buddha's teachings. Uh, when these teachings are praised by the wise, they should be developed. When these teaching lead, teachings lead to unbinding and calm, they should be developed. So what do you think, Kalam, is when the defilements do not arise in a person, is this for their long-term welfare and happiness and for others' long-term welfare and happiness? For everyone's long-term welfare and happiness. And this person, free of the defilements, does not kill living beings or take what is not given or take another spouse, or lie, or induce others to lie. So what do you think? Are these qualities skillful, shameless, and praised by the wise? They are, sir. When developed and acted on, they bring long-term welfare and happiness to one's, to oneself and others. Now, Kalamas, one who follows the Dhamma, free of greed, aversion, or deluded thinking, alert and mindful of the Eightfold Path, experiences their life imbued with goodwill. Everywhere they go, their mindfulness is imbued with goodwill, with gratitude, with a mind resting in equanimity. They are abundant and free from all agitation towards themselves and all humanity. So there's more to it. Uh, and well, let, me, let me just go to conclude this because it, it, uh, it's up on the screen too. In them, they have the developed in one free of the defilements from following the Dhamma, following the Dhamma. And the Buddha, again, always taught a very specific and very clear Dhamma. And so the, uh, the, the Kalamas 
let me go back one one page uh, so when one follows the eightfold path free from greed aversion and deluded thinking undefiled and pure there are four qualities they will naturally develop they will give rise to pleasant experiences in the present moment meaning our lives immediately begin to improve they will give rise to pleasant experiences in the future we can take refuge in that if harm is done with no intention no suffering will touch them and if one remains harmless they can know that they are pure and no suffering will again will touch them these are the, the four qualities naturally developed in one free of the, of the defilements. So again, a very direct and simple teaching on the importance of developing uh, the Dhamma as it was presented and keeping that refined mindfulness as our way of recognizing if something is useful or if something is likely to lead to more confusion and, and, uh, and ongoing suffering. So that's the end of the talk. Uh, any questions or comments on it from either one of you? I have no questions, but just a comment. One of the reasons that I decided to buy your book and study with you was that as I started looking into Buddhism and trying to pick a direction or a teacher or a, a lineage to follow, I just was so confused and unattracted to these things because they just seemed to have so much to them that was not pertinent to what I needed to know. And so when I stumbled across you, I was really very, very happy because you just cut all that out and went right into the source, which is, you know, the Pali Canon and you know, what specifically the Buddha taught that we can prove that the Buddha taught without all the other cultural and geographic influences. So it's, it's, been really enlightening for me, you know, coming to Buddhism, I, I didn't start with you, but, but you certainly have really opened my eyes to a lot of things. So thank you. Well, thank you for, for your, your words, Lynn. Uh, you use that word unattractive. And I struggled with that for so many years with all the different um, Buddhist schools that I was involved with, because I was unattracted to what was being presented often but i felt like i should be this this should be something people are telling me this is this is the dharma this is what you should be developing and this is how it should look and none of it or i shouldn't say none of it but most of it made no sense and a lot of it was increasing my confusion um but because it was presented in that way as as a um, a true teaching of the buddha i felt that it should be attractive to me and, and what's wrong with me rather than understanding that it wasn't something that was wrong with me it was something that was um not consistent in the presentation and i reason i say that we're not consistent because i'm not saying that other buddhist teachers are insincere i think most of the teachers i've come across are sincere in what they're teaching but their teachings are not rooted in what the buddha taught they're, ta they're rooted in something that developed later that was part of a uh, or at least in part culturally or individually influenced. And that really changes everything, even today, uh, even in, in a lot of modern Buddhist teachers that um, continue to, to teach in a way that they present it as a direct teaching of the Buddha, but it's really not, it's adapted in some way. And I've, and I've never found an adaptation or accommodation that, that was that was more effective in the direct than the direct teachings of the Buddha. And it's so important. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I like to I like to read a variety of teachers from different lineages, but without having the foundation of what exactly the Buddha taught, you don't really know when you read somebody where they're getting their thought process from. Is it coming from the Buddha's teachings? Is it coming from, you know, some teacher they had down the line or their culture? And you, you, it's hard to know what to believe or what to. I don't know how to put it, how to find the truth in what they say when there's so much dogma and culture and ritual and non-related things attached to it. So it really helps me to have this foundation. Yeah, uh, and that's just it. it it's it, it, Unless you have the, the understanding of what the Buddhists actually taught, it's impossible to separate what is presented as authentic teachings from what really is it. And again, if you don't have that foundation in the Four Noble Truths, you really can't understand what the Buddha taught. Uh, the other interesting thing that comes from reading the Pali Canon, and I, I, I'll, you know, I, I'll give you all that it's a difficult read, but it's certainly worthwhile, is you understand 
how the Buddha taught in, in, in the, in that, that he never left that, that overarching framework of the four noble truths. And he never taught another path other than the eightfold path. And in the suttas, you can, you can see how he keeps bringing that back in uh, as an important part of the teaching rather than just trying to explain the arising uh, of, of impermanent phenomena, meaning individual suffering. It all comes back to that. And that's such an important thing to remember. And it's what's often lost. Um, and well, I'll, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. I don't want to get too long on a, on our uh, noon class, but Kevin, do you, I see Nada has joined us. Hi Nada. Good to see you. Uh, let me invite Nada on screen. I think I'll take this, the uh, article off and see if Nada wants to join us. So Nada, if you want to and you can join us, please join us on screen. Give, ah, hello, Nada. Hello. Yes. Hello. Nada, nice. Nat, Nada is joining us from Sweden. It's great to great to see you. you. What, what time is it there? Is it around six in the evening? Yes, it's right? six hours uh, ahead of where you guys are. Okay, good. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Um, I just like to say, Lynn, that your comment about having a foundation and a basis it was really good. No, oh, thank you. Yeah. That's thanks to John. Well, <laughs> yeah. but that, it's also a great example of of the importance of a sangha. You know that this is this is how a sangha supports each other, whether we're we're online and a few miles apart, or actually sitting in the same room. So yeah, thank you, Lynn. It, it, it's so important, and this is how it works. Well, again, go, getting back to that last comment on how the Buddha taught. A lot of his teachings was was um, arising contemporaneously about what was going on in the sangha at the moment, and some of it was a direct question, and some of it you can you can kind of read between the lines and see that the Buddha was very astute at listening to what was going on in the in the in the sangha, and he would bring a topic up related to that, and and this is another example when he he heard that the Kalamas were having this difficulty this deciding who do we follow and how do we figure it out. And he gave this this really important teaching. This is to me the the Kalama Sutta is one of the important suttas, most important suttas in the Pali Canon, because it refers back to the importance of the only way you can know the efficacy of my teaching is to actually engage in it. You have to experience it, and that's what he means about Ehepasiko, come and see for yourself. Which doesn't mean we should pick and choose the experience we want. We should recognize that our experiences are clouded by our own conditioned thinking. And we need a clear path to to break through that conditioned thinking, which is really the, the main reason why the Buddha taught an eightfold path and not simply meditation. Do you agree, Kevin? Yes. Kind of dry in a little bit. Yes. <laughs> uh, I I liked the point of the article when you know you were referencing your own experience, but I think you almost want to put parentheses your own experience within the, the, con the context of the Dhamma or the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, because you know, as you said, you, there's a lot of teachings out there that are picking and choosing, you know, oh, we'll be mindful of this or we'll take some Vipassana here. And it's it's really, you know, those are good things to integrate into your life. But if they're not in the right framework and you have a wrong view, then you, you, it's not going to get to where this great man, the Buddha, was trying to what, what, what path he was trying to lay down for us, you know, and, and give us. So really appreciate it. Oh, again, thank you for your kind words. You're absolutely right. It has to be presented in the right context or it has no meaning. I, I had a, I know you, you've heard me say this before, Kevin, There, I had a teacher many years ago. His name was Arnold Patton. He wasn't a, a Buddhist, uh, but he, he, he taught a lot of basic Buddhist principles. And one of the things that he said that I still remember to this day is that importance of putting things in the right context. And the way he did that he taught that was that if you're in New York and you want to get to Chicago, but you believe you're in Los Angeles, you can't get there. You simply do not have the context for getting from point A to point B in the way that you'd like. You have to have that foundational understanding of what the Buddha taught, why he taught it, and what was the purpose of his teaching, which is to alleviate stress and suffering. To many people, that sounds almost too simplistic or not even worthwhile until you understand that the common human problem, what drives all of us, is that need to, to create a life that is constantly pleasurable and avoid anything that is bringing us displeasure or stress. And that becomes it's a life of constant distraction, chasing 
sensory input rather than recognizing the, the true nature of the world, which is an ever-changing and permanent uh, phenomena. So, very important teaching. I'm glad you could uh, join us. Are there any other questions? So let's meditate. I'll take you off screen uh, so the camera is not on you while you're meditating. Uh, take care, Lynn. Take care, Kevin. See you now. I'll invite you up after after we meditate. We'll have a 25-minute meditation. So find your relaxed meditative posture and gently close your eyes and gently close your mouths. And take a moment to become aware of the sensation of breathing in your body. And while remaining mindful of your breath in your body, notice that thoughts are flowing. We're conscious beings. Thoughts should be flowing. The purpose of Shamatha Vipassana meditation is to not be distracted by our own thoughts. So when you find that you're caught up in your thinking again, simply acknowledge that and return your mindfulness to the sensation of breathing. Relaxing thoughts, remaining mindful of our breathing. And we'll meditate for 20 minutes with callbacks every five minutes.
relaxing thoughts, remaining mindful of our breathing. Relaxing thoughts, remaining mindful of our breathing.
relaxing thoughts, remaining mindful of our breathing. If a persistent thought or feeling arises, stay with it for a moment or two, recognize it as impermanent, and return your mindfulness to the sensation of breathing. And we'll meditate for five more minutes.
take a moment to notice the quality of your mind. Be at peace with your mind. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. So I'm going to invite you all back on screen uh, before we finish up. Lynn and Nada and Kevin. Let me do that again. I notice that sometimes this is difficult. Ah, there you go. Nat, if you look at, I think you have to scroll down to see the accept button, but I'll try it once more. It keeps moving around. I find it in a different place every time we do this. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you're looking at a slightly different screen than I have, but ah, there's Nata. So we're all, we're all back together again. Um, so any, any questions or comments about today's talk or the Dhamma in general? Um, it's called meditation practice for a reason. Um, <laughs> pra practice makes perfect. Um, I, yes. I found that it was like after about 15 minutes, I could actually calm down, see my breath, feel my breath, count the breath. Um, and it wasn't that it was like, there was like single focus thoughts, but it was just like, oh, and this and this and this and this. And I'm like, okay, yes, practice. One must practice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. And and if you remember that, we're meditating primarily to deepen concentration. When we find it, we're caught up in the, the this and that and come back to our breath. That's just what we're doing. And that, uh, that continued practice within the framework of the Eightfold Path uh, develops great concentration. And, uh, and thank you for bringing that up, Nat. It's it's so important to remember. This isn't something that's um, that's automatically given to us just because we decide we want to meditate. We have to put in right effort, and through right effort, we develop uh, a very useful dhamma. So, uh, good class. Anything else? No, you. I just have a question. It doesn't yeah. have anything to do with the class, but. Um... Do you regularly have days where you can get through the day without a single unskillful thought? You personally, as a long time what, practitioner. What a, what, a, what a great question. Um, and let me, let me put a little thought to it. Um, you know, it, it really depends on what you, what you might call unskillful. So I can tell you honestly that I've had days where I, I have had, no thoughts that lead to a disturbance in my mind. But I, but I do notice that I do notice things that are not in accordance with the Buddhist teachings. And, and I, I do notice that things occur in the world that I wouldn't say I wish would be different, but I notice that it would be beneficial for everyone if they were different. And I'm honestly questioning mm -hmm. myself: is is that a a very subtle form of a de, of desire, or is it simply a recognition of things as they are? But it's a great question. Um, and so, to take that just a little bit further, I think it's important to recognize. Let me put it this way: an awakened, fully mature human being is not someone who um, thinks that everything is wonderful because that's not the nature of the world. The, the Buddha described the nature of the world basically as there is stress, there is suffering, there is unsatisfactory experiences. So recognizing that um, unsatisfactory or disappointing experiences or occurrences arise in, our, in the world is not an aspect of a disturbed mind, but it's when we react to that. And so that's what I'm getting to. I'm not, I'm not entirely certain that, I'm, that there's not a measure of reaction but I do not notice any disturbance. I have days where I do not notice any disturbance in my mind. And those are usually days when I'm completely disentangled from the world. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm able to, to and I, I do take days like that, that I'm just, uh, because I spend so much time engaged in the world, I do take days where I, I purposely stay disentangled or, or disengaged from the world. And those are very peaceful days. <laughs> taking, That's a great question. Taking refuge, right, John? Taking refuge. Yeah. 
and <laughs> when you read the the uh, the account of the Buddha's life, and he was certainly involved in the world around him, um, and often very intense ways. He was he was counselor to uh, to kings and leaders uh, in an almost constant um, in an almost constant engagement that way. And there were times when he pointed out, oftentimes when he pointed out. Um, things that were arising in the world and that we had control over as uh, uh, that can be hurtful and to recognize those and to uh, engage in the virtuous behavior so that we don't contribute to that uh, harmfulness. And we can do that even with our own thoughts and a disturbed quality of mind. Uh, I hate to go there because I've been spending too much time talking about it, but the results of our election here in the United States is an example of um, what happens when we, react very, very strongly to wanting things to be different than they are. And that can lead to very unskillful behavior. I'm getting past um, the parameters of your question, Lynn, but that, that's where it led me. So, <laughs> uh, okay. so I, I thought that uh, Lynn's comments uh, were pretty, or the teachings of restraint were pretty relevant to Lynn's comments, you know, as, as we go throughout our day, practicing restraint, you know, it, unskillable thoughts may come into our head and that's probably there's not much we can do to control or, or maybe i should say that um you know worldly causes and conditions or dukkha will often come to us and perhaps the unskillable thought but then the restraint you know leads us from getting further into conditioned mind states so i, I thought the restraint yeah. was pretty it was sort of right in front of me when you were saying that lynn so that was pretty neat that mm -hmm. you did that. That's a great point, Kevin. The um, remember the Buddha taught restraint at the six senses and not just the, the five physical senses, but the sense of our intellect and our ongoing thought process. So when something unskillful occurs in the world, and we do not react to it, but we simply note it, that's an aspect of guarding that six that that sixth sense of intellect and not letting it run amok. And not reacting to us so of course we're not and that points to that idea that an awakened human being doesn't think anymore we learn how to think and we learn what to think what's most appropriate in this moment and then we can develop that i stated often we can be at peace with less than peaceful mind states we can acknowledge the um the, the sometime chaotic nature of the world around us or even what might be occurring within our own body and our own mind in the moment and yet we can remain at peace with that the buddha described an awakened human being in very clear and direct terms as having a, a peaceful calm mind a lasting peaceful and calm mind a mind of equanimity that's what we're that's what we're developing within the dhamma and it all points to that it all points to restraint too that last week's topic what a, a great discussion the whole point of the sangha uh anything else yeah i'd just like to say that then the talk you did that you posted on the Facebook page just after the election in the United States, um, it was so interesting to have that, to hear the Sangha's ideas and concerns and frustrations and fears um, afterwards. And you started out, I think, saying something like, well, I don't want to get into this. And then it was like, <laughs> and then it was like the next 30 minutes of really interesting discussion. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and it was so good. It was so good because sitting abroad and having, you know, whatever news we get, but to hear it from the Sangha's um, perspective. And as, as you were saying, uh, Kevin, with, with restraint or, or as you were saying, Lynn, with, with the foundation and coming from that point and seeing it from that perspective as, as opposed to just a media's perspective. So thank you for ha keeping that on there, John. It was great. Well, thank you. I said that, um, that qualifying statement, I don't want to get into this, I think five or six times, and it led to about a half hour, 45 minutes. I even said it last night at the Donna dinner, and it, <laughs> and it led to another discussion. What, what's your um, perspective on that, Nata, from, from Sweden? Wow, I don't want to get into it, but... I think it's, it's um, one, of, one of shock and one of not really comprehending I, I, this is a generalization not really comprehending what drove the the people who voted for trump to vote for him not really understanding that that sort of mindset behind it as i said the, the conversation coming from the sangha was interesting because it was okay well, well this is how it is and 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 how can we how how do we 
wrap our mind around that just to be with what is so and it and it is impermanent um yeah. but the, the the generalization is sort of like wow and what next what's what's he going to do next so yes. I, I keep going back to that talk to, to listen to all all of the points about focus and impermanence and <laughs> calm which is really there's good a, yeah and there, there's a there was a kind of a common theme that was most disturbing to people and it was how could anyone vote for him mm. and of course it's a reasonable question but it's also rooted in an extreme view that there aren't other people with views in the world yeah they have that, that too <laughs> and and so there is an awful lot of people 50 million or so that believe that trump held more useful more useful views for the United States right now. And of course, there was an equal number that felt the felt differently. The the insistence that one view is a correct view and, and the and another view is a wrong view is kind of the essence of stress and suffering, isn't it? Rather than that, accepting like that. Duca, right? Duca comes to us. Well, Kevin pointed out that, that Duca flows into our into our world and having that extreme view, you know, as you just said, the extreme view is, well, our view has to be right. What happened? And the other view is, well, as you said, he might have had good things to offer other people. So yes, where, yes. Where, where is the Swedes have a great term. It's called logom, L-A-G-O-M. And it means like just so that that it's just right in the middle. Everything is fine. Like you, you have a, a logom amount of coffee. Not too much, not too little, right <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> that really is. That really is. Just starting to get some feedback on this. Probably time Probably to go. Time to go. Um, it, it, it's it's an interesting um, it's interesting what's happened uh, since the election and even the probably the whole campaign really. Um, if you understand the first noble truth that there are disappointing experiences in life, and that craving originates and clinging perpetuates that and, and increases it that's exactly what happens to a reaction and certainly the strong reaction to the election the election itself and not, and not just united states politics but worldwide politics are an expression of there are disappointing experiences in life that's all that there are there's always going to be people that are disappointed no matter who's in power whether it's it's a military takeover or a peaceful transition of power like what happens in the United States. It's it's the nature of the world and it's it's reflected in the political and the uh, geopolitical process, just there. No reason to get upset about it and we do the best we can. Uh, and what's most importantly as people developing and practicing the Eightfold Path is to maintain a mind of calm and equanimity because then we're able to respond to whatever is occurring in the world with with peace and with a refined mindfulness that's framed through right action. Uh, and then we can truly bring a, a meaningful change in the world. So imagine if Trump becomes a, a practicing Buddhist in the next. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him a copy of the book and just see what good it does. <laughs> you never know. But we, we're yeah. all in a position where we don't have to lose our minds over it. And that's, yeah, that's exactly. really the important thing. Um, well, with that in mind, uh, let's conclude with the with the uh, the the word the Buddha's words on meta. Um, give me a hint, give me a second, boys, uh, and we can bring uh, President Elect Trump in mind uh, while we're uh, practicing meta. And so, uh, let me find it. I'm going I'm to read the Buddha's words on meta. So find your relaxed. I'm going to leave you on screen too. Find your relaxed meditative posture and gently close your eyes and gently close your mouths. And take a moment to become aware of the sensation of breathing in our bodies. And let that mindfulness of our breath cease any distracting thoughts to the past or to the future or that may have arisen from our talk today. And meta is both a, uh, an aspiration for those of us developing the Eightfold Path and an expression of a fully awakened, fully mature human being. And these are the Buddha's words on meta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied. 
unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful Dhamma stream class. Have a great holiday. Peace. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye, Lou. Take care, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks. See you next week. Saturday. See you Saturday. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye-bye, Lynn.